Uh, but, um, the first thing I'd like to do is to welcome our new student commissioner. And Commissioner Davis, you're going to have to help me with the pronunciation of your first name. Is it Sadie or how do you say it? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. It is Shade Davis. I'm definitely honored to be the new student commissioner for this year. And thank you all for having me. It is a pleasure. Great. Well, we're delighted to have you also. And Commissioner Davis is a student um, at Prince, Prince George's Community College. And um, uh, we're just absolutely delighted to have you with us. Would you like to say anything else about your background, perhaps what you're studying and what you hope to do? Absolutely. Um, I am a second year student at Prince George's Community College. My major is health science. And when I go on to my bachelor's degree program, I will pursue my passion in public health. I would love to continue to deal with policies and procedures and allowing myself to be in any arena to help make changes and reform in the healthcare arena for all citizens of not only Maryland, but the United States. Uh, great, that's all terrific. Well, again, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, and if at any time you have any questions about um, procedures or need more clarification, don't hesitate to to ask us and get all the information that you need. Thank you so much. Um, just a quick review of the agenda we have. I mean, we'll approve the minutes and do commit and do committee updates. Uh, we have two action items before us. Uh, one is new, so we'll. Um, just be looking at that for the first time, and then we'll have a final consideration um, of the uh, transfer uh, policy that um, uh, is ready for a final vote. And then we'll move into our review meeting um, after we conclude that business. Secretary Fielder, let me turn things over to you to see if you have any comments. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to our new student commissioner. We're so pleased to have you and one of the first uh, community college students that we've had instead of a four year. So we're looking for that perspective and involvement with us. Also wanted to say that as of July 1, we kicked in our new um, fiscal year and, and that brought about the need to hire the additional staff in the academic unit, which is underway with now about five completed out of the 10 um, Jeff Newman is leading the charge on getting everything done on the telework side in terms of the IT cubicles and preparing everyone for that. So that's that's marching forward. We've had very positive meetings with the president of each of the HBCUs and discussions about what to expect in terms of academic program requests. So that's a very quick summation and uh, back to you, Mary Pat. Okay, thanks, Secretary Gilder. Um I have one more item uh, that I'd like to um, cover before we uh, move on to the approval of the minutes. Um, and that is um, to let you know that we have a nomination for the position of vice chair. Commissioner Boyd nominated Commissioner McDaniels. Um, and so Commissioner Boyd, could I ask you to um, formally propose that nomination and then I'll get a second and then I'll see if there are any other nominations on the floor. Indeed. Uh, so, Chair of the Commission, I'm very pleased to nominate Charles McDaniels as a Vice President candidate for the Commission itself. Um, I don't think, I think that his record is fairly outstanding in and of itself, and I need not give more time to discuss that. So, I so move that that occurs. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Boyd. And could I have a second, please? Second, Barbara Howe. That, thank you, uh, Commissioner Howe. And um, are there any other nominations from the board? I, I shouldn't joke about this because this is a serious matter and, and I am absolutely delighted that Commissioner McDaniel um, um, was um, ready to have his name put before us. So I'm going to assume since I don't hear a rush of other names coming that we can vote. So all in favor, of uh, electing Commissioner uh, McDaniels into the vice chair role of the commission, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 That, and Debbie, I'm assuming you can get all of that. Yes, I have. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, Commissioner McDaniels, thank you so much. Um, congratulations, and we're all delighted. 
Um, and um, Commissioner McDaniels and I were emailing back and forth. Um, at least at this point, um, he can continue as chair of the DEI committee. So um, he's not stepping down from that, which we're most grateful for. So there are no public comments uh, today. And so let's, uh, let me um, ask for approval of the minutes. If I could have a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting of June 22nd, 2022. Commissioner Howe moves um, approval of the minutes. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner uh, Howe, could I have a second? Jim Coleman. Second. Great, thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Any abstentions? Anybody not in favor? Okay, thank you. The good minutes are approved. Uh, let's move on to uh -huh. um, committee updates. And Commissioner Boyd, I'm going to throw this back to you for the Education Policy Committee. Okay. As you know, the Educational Policy Commission responds to incoming issues, and at the moment, that seems to be at a lull. The news that we have is the loss of our student commissioner, uh, Anna Kaya, who uh, is moving on to greater and better things, so we'll be looking for a replacement, hopefully, of that member on the group. But for the moment, things are fairly quiet for the Education Policy Committee. Okay, thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions for Commissioner Boyd? Okay, hearing none, uh, let me move on to Commissioner Coleman for the Outreach Grants and Financial Assistance Committee. Uh, yes, the committee will meet again in August after they uh, join their brief summer vacation. In the meantime, I'd like to welcome our, uh, one of our co uh, committee members, Kendall Cook. Kendall uh, was working with M. Heck in, uh, left in 21 to pursue his education and he returned in a new position as a uh, uh, as, uh, um, specialist in M. Heck. I forgot the towel he's, he's now. But anyway, he's back and he's working on his doctorate. And also, I would like to personally welcome uh, Shade uh, Davis to this committee. Uh, as you stated before, she brings a lot of expert and you will be your you will be the student voice for the students for M. And we welcome you to this committee. So we welcome Ms. Cook and also uh, we welcome um glad to have Cook back and glad to have Ms. Avis back. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Commissioner Coleman. Any questions for Commissioner Coleman? Actually, um, I don't have a, a question. I also want to welcome the Kendall Cook back. He did a tremendous job when he was here before, and we lost him as in the pursuit of a PhD, but we've been able to attract him back, and we're just so excited to have him back in the team and, and watch this continue to grow. I just really appreciate you being back. Thank you, yes. Kendall. Thank you, Secretary Fielder. Um, Mr. Newman, Finance and Operations Committee. Is Jeff, you might be muted. Sorry. Uh, as the secretary referred to earlier, we're um, academic affairs is working to fill the new uh, positions in the uh, program review unit. Um, as a result, they have moved a few people from one of our other units over into this unit. So now we have some vacancies in um, collegiate affairs that we'll be looking to fill, as well as the um, associate director of collegiate affairs. Um, our associate director left um, several weeks ago, and we've had some turnover in our associate director of career and workforce education. Um, and um, a few positions here and there in the agency. So we continue to work to fill our vacancies as well as the new vacancies. Uh, the new fiscal year has started. We're almost close to a month, coming up on a month into our uh, new fiscal year. Um, so Aubrey Bascom is very busily trying to close out fiscal uh, 2022. 
while we open up the new fiscal year. So um, that's about all from upper finance okay. operations. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Any questions for Mr. Newman? All right, let's move on to the final report. Commissioner McDaniels, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, um, and now Vice Chair of the Commission. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the DEI committee did not meet in the month of uh, July. Uh, we are getting organized to go after our targets and goals for the balance of uh, uh, the year starting in September. So we really don't have an update at this time, but we are getting ourselves organized so that we're ready to go in September. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for Commissioner McDaniels? Okay, all right. Uh, so I think that finalizes our committee updates. And Mr. Newman, I'm going to turn things back over to you for uh, the explanation of the amendment to the Community College's student um, residency policy. Okay, thank you. Um, on pages nine and 10, you'll see this item in your commission books. Um, in the 2022 um, legislative session, the state enacted section 15106.11 of the education article, annotated code of Maryland. This new provision exempts return police corps, I'm sorry, Peace Corps volunteers who are domiciled in Maryland. Uh, from paying non-resident tuition at public institutions of higher education in the state and also establishes that return Peace Corps volunteer students um, at the community colleges be included as in-state residents for the computation of state aid through the CAID formula for the community colleges. Enclosed for your review and approval is a proposed regulatory amendment that reflects that return Peace Corps volunteer students as defined in state law, shall be included as in state residents for the computation of state aid for the community colleges. Um, upon your approval, these proposed regulations, regulatory amendments are submitted to the legislature's joint committee on uh, administrative, executive, and legislative review, after which they are submitted to the Division of State Documents for publication in the Maryland Register. Um, after a brief comment period, they may be brought back before the commission for final adoption. The recommendation is, it is recommended that the commission approve for publication in the Maryland Register the enclosed proposed regulatory amendment to the computation of state aid for community colleges and authorize the assistant attorneys general to make non-substantive edits to the proposed regulations to conform to the stylistic and formatting requirements of the administrative, executive, legislative review, and the division of state documents. Great, um, thank you, Mr. Newman. Let me ask uh, that we get this um, on the floor as a motion to approve, and I'm not going to reread it. It's on page nine, and it's exactly as Mr. Newman uh, just read it to us. So could I have a motion to approve this recommendation? Commissioner Coleman, uh, move that we approve okay. the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Howell. Coleman. Could I have thank, thank you, Commissioner Howell. Okay, any um, any questions um, for Jeff? Anybody need any clarification? All right, if I start going too fast, because I, again, I don't have any visual to read people's faces at all. Um, please speak up and stop me, but it's, um, otherwise, I'm going to um, ask us to move on the motion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, that, thank you, Mr. Newman. Uh, Dr. Dow, uh, let me turn things over to you um, for an explanation of some of the changes that have been made since we last saw this and your plans for still addressing some issues that have arisen. Absolutely, thank, thank you and, and good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Uh, before I begin, let me also uh, share a welcome to our new student commissioner, Commissioner Davis. Welcome to the team. I look forward to working with you over the next year and I'll be reaching out to you shortly on student advisory council and a few other things, so welcome. 
Uh, now into the uh, transfer regulations. On March 23rd, the commission approved for publication in the Maryland Register proposed new regulations and regulatory amendments regarding the transfer of students between public institutions uh, within, within Maryland. The regulations repeal all nine existing MHEC regulations governing transfer and articulation agreements. It replaces them with 15 new regulations and amends five other existing regulations. A summary of those changes are provided in the commission memo. The proposed regulations were published in the Maryland Register. Uh, public comments were received from representatives from the University of Maryland, Towson University, University of Baltimore, and University of Maryland local campus. We carefully reviewed each public comment and held follow-up meetings to obtain additional information and clarification regarding their comments. We also held an additional meeting with representatives from Anne Arundel Community College and Salisbury University. We would like to thank all of those individuals for their time and thoughtfulness in responding to our questions and uh, those follow-up meetings and their contributions to ensuring accuracy, clarity, and functionality in these regulations. As a result of those conversations and comments, the enclosed text include two non-substantive changes. Changes to proposed regulations may be made in the process of final adoption if they are certified as non-substantive by agency legal counsel, which is the case here. So let me just review those two non-substantive changes. Two commenters noted that the definition of transfer student had a misplaced phrase that modified the meaning of the definition. This was a drafting error and a change has been made to clarify that a transfer student is a student who completed prior college coursework after graduating high school, not before. Because this drafting error restores the definition to the meaning it has under current regulations, council has determined that this is non-substantive. And you can find this change on page five of the regulations. The second non-substantive change uh, includes a requirement that full articulation agreements be published in an institution's course catalog. Comments noted that, this, uh, that the challenges this requirement poses, particularly when catalogs are physically printed. So consequently, this requirement has been removed, though institutions will still be required to post full, full articulation agreements in publicly accessible sources. Because this change removes a minor requirement resulting in a slightly lower burden on institutions without any substantial increase in the burden to students in locating these agreements, it's been determined to be non-substantive by council. Again, this change is on both, uh, uh, this change is reflected on pages six and nine of the attached regulations. So on to kind of the substantive changes. The comments also led to the discussion of additional substantive uh, and of additional substance, substantial, sorry, issue regarding the transferability equivalency standard and the transfer evaluation process that has been informally raised by institutions over the past year. We have come to believe that adding additional provisions to provide more detail is necessary. We need to balance the needs of transfer students and ensure equity between transfer and non-transfer students while maintaining effective procedures that do not add time consuming or redundant processes. So this issue requires extensive changes and absolutely additional stakeholder input. We have determined that the best course of action is to address this issue in future regulatory amendments. So uh, experts, uh, so expect more on regulations in coming months. Therefore, the enclosed regulations are ready for the commission's final adoption with the non-substantive changes to the proposed text uh, shown in the document. The new regulations and regulatory amendments will become effective 10 days after notice of final adoption uh, published in the Maryland Register. Before I read the formal recommendations, I would also like to recognize Soma Kadia and her essential role in drafting these regulations. This really could not have been done without her expertise and support. So I want to uh, formally recognize my gratitude to her and working through this. 
So let me read the formal recommendation. Uh, it is recommended that the commission approves for final adoption the enclosed regulations, including the non-substantive changes indicated in the text regarding transfer between public institutions of higher education in the state. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dow. Let me get the um, motion on the floor and then we'll open it up for questions. So could I please have a motion to approve the recommendation? I so move, Commissioner Boyd. Thank you, Commissioner Boyd, and could I have a second? Second, Jim Salinger. Thank you, Commissioner Salinger. Okay, let's open it up for any questions that we might have. Um, Dr. Dow, I'm going to start. I have just a couple, um, and I appreciate the adjustment that was made in defining you know, when college credits are earned, and this only affects credits earned after a student has graduated from high school. Um, but am I correct that the earlier uh, definition allowed students to have 12 hours before be being considered a transfer student, and then now we're saying it's one course? Correct. We, uh, for the purposes, so yes, yes, uh, that is correct. We Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Go ahead. We, we opted to take away that 12 credit minimum because it then put students who were between one course and 12 credits kind of in uh, purgatory, right? They're kind of in the middle of, of what this all means. So we decided for the purposes of interpreting these regulations and implementing these regulations, if a student has at least one completed course at the time of transfer, these regulations should apply to them. Okay, and and this may not be a concern for MHEC. I know that for some institutions, they treat financial aid for transfer students and first year students differently. I'm going to assume that institutions will still have the discretion as to how they want to categorize students for financial aid. Absolutely, absolutely. We do, I believe, have language uh, in the drafted regulations that say this is not intended to especially unduly impact students when it comes to tran uh, when it comes to financial aid and the admissions process. So yes, okay. it's intended okay. to be a definition to interpret particular to interpret how to deny credit and what students apply. Okay. That all right, and then, and then I have one more question around the equivalency issue. I understand that that is going to require some more discussion and research and deliberation, but does, if we approve this, does that mean that the language we have now on determining equivalency stands, or should we you know, say that that's hold, held out for a time until you resolve these other issues? So right now, how we're envisioning it, it would stand. That is that is our intent. I think we, we have a plan to go forward that we want to present back to stakeholders. What we would be doing is adding in either an additional step or additional rules when determining equivalencies. Um, so right now, we're a little bit narrow in defining equivalency, which is OK we want to provide some additional context for when there may not be equivalency, but an institution really should take that course uh, and transfer okay. it. So that's, so okay. maybe adding to it, not necessarily changing what we have right now. All right, and one last question. How long do you think it will take you and others to resolve this issue? Yeah. So don't hold me to it. Our plan is to re reconvene the group within the next four weeks before the start of the mm -hmm. fall semester, present our proposal to them, um, maybe have another meeting afterwards while they can discuss with colleagues and other representatives on the campus. So maybe another one to three meetings uh, with stakeholders okay. and then bring it back okay. to the commission in October. Okay. All right. Thank you. That helps. Yep. Uh, does any does anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay, then I um, the motion is on the floor. All in favor, please signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, the recommendation carries. Um,
and we'll look forward to hearing back from you um, as you have the additional conversations. And and I know, you know, I said this the last time, I know this has been a huge undertaking. So, um, Emily, our thank you to you and to Selma and all the others who work with you and, and to representatives from the institutions who were willing to um, share their comments and, and recommendations. So thank you for all of that. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, um, so um, let me ask if, uh, before we move into the review meeting, does anyone have any other business to raise? Okay, then uh, did I hear somebody say something? No, I started to say I see no hands raised. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Secretary Fielder. Okay, so um, we'll move into the review part of the meeting in which we are, um, we'll be reviewing Morgan State University's proposed Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity Intelligence Management, uh, to which uh, University of Maryland Global College has asked us to review the Secretary's decision giving approval to that program. Uh, and Secretary, and so the procedures for today, and I think you all know this already, um, Secretary Fielder, you and if Dr. Dowell is speaking also, you jointly have 30 minutes um, to present and to answer any questions that the commissioners have. Uh, similarly, uh, UMCG, uh, President Fowler, you and your team will have 30 minutes for the same. Um, and then President Wilson, um, you and anyone else from Morgan State University would have 10 minutes for any remarks that you wish to make. Um, I'm going to be a little flexible if we start getting a lot of questions. So, you know, I don't want um, the presenters to feel like you've got to race through and don't have a chance to get to everything that you want to say. What I will do is, um, give you a warning at about 20 minutes so that we can pause to see if there are any questions and then uh, see where we go from there. Uh, so Secretary Fielder, if you'd like to begin, and um, I believe Jennifer Katz is on with us. Jennifer, if you'd help me, you and Debbie would help me just watch the time. Yes, Chair, so I can Okay, thank you. So, Secretary. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I do not anticipate needing the, the 30 minutes for our uh, presentation. The um, review meeting has to do with Morgan State University's proposal of a new Bachelor's in Science in Cybersecurity Intelligence Management's dual modality, meaning online and on campus, which was approved decision. And then we had an objection by University of Maryland Global Campus on March the 11th of 22. And once that occurs, it triggers a period of time when the secretary and, and academic affairs staff would meet with each of the two parties and attempt to try to negotiate, see whether there's collaboration or agreements in order to try to re re reverse or remove the objection. We had those those meetings with uh, UMGC on April the 18th with Dean Harrison, Senior VP of Academic Affairs, Senior VP of Government, and President Fowler. Then we had the subsequent meeting with Morgan State University with President Wilson and Provost Yu. Um, those meetings resulted in not resolving the situation uh, with an unwillingness to collaborate. So I wanted to move forward. Um, pursuant to the regulations, I submit the following statement to the Maryland Higher Education Commission in support of my May 16th decision to approve Morgan State University's proposed Bachelor of Science. There are currently five institutions in Maryland offering an undergraduate bachelor's degree under the U.S. Department of Education's classification of instruction programs. And you've heard us use this term repeatedly, the SIP code, CIP code, and that's what it means. This code is the Computer and Information System Security. So with Johns Hopkins University in 03 added, Capital Technology, in 2003, University of Maryland Global Campus, 2007, Frostburg, 2012, and Mount St. Mary's in 2016. The description for this CIP code is a program that prepares individuals to assess security needs of computer and network systems, recommend safeguard solutions, and manage the implementation and maintenance of security devices, 
systems and procedures. It includes instruction in computer architecture, programming, systems analysis, networking, telecommunications, security system design, applicable law and regulations, risk assessment and policy analysis, contingency planning, user assess, access issues and investigation techniques and troubleshooting. As I said, in February 2022, Morgan requested the approval. UMG objected within the 10 days. On uh, March the 11th, we held those, those two meetings, uh, which I've given you the dates. And the decision to approve this program, I based it really on the duplication analysis. And there's three primary reasons that I believe this program are recommended approval for the program. I request that my decision to approve the proposed program be affirmed by the commission. Three primary reasons. Market demand currently outstrips the supply. The state has a substantial and growing need for cybersecurity management professionals. In materials previously supplied to you, we listed the five institutions and the degree of production. And you'll note that it's under 500 degrees per year. Yet the need for these new uh, positions is 1,314 projected per year. And material provided by UMGC indicates that, that is a low estimate. So um, what we're looking at, of course, then is a, a shortfall. And we know that within our economy in the state of Maryland, cybersecurity and intelligent management side is growing tremendously. So in order to be robust, we need to keep moving with this. Despite the average of the 500 graduates over the past five years, even if every graduate state in Maryland, the current undergraduate programs in Maryland cannot meet the projected need, um, as I just stated, by 2028. And so we find the compelling evidence of the substantial current and projected need for managers in the cybersecurity field in the state is current and will continue to grow. And with that, I'd like to have Dr. Dow speak to the academic content comparison that we completed, which will demonstrate that there's a substantial difference with Morgan's program adding 42 credits in the business college, um, whereas UMGC does not. Go ahead, Dr. Dow. Great. Thank you, Secretary Fielder. Uh, so as we note in, in, sec in the uh, Secretary's statement, the, the program descriptions and programmatic outcomes of the two programs are similar, uh, and you have that information in tables three and four. The specific curricular content of the two programs is distinct. A review of the curricula indicates that the proposed program from Morgan includes a significant number of traditional business courses that the existing program at UMGC does not require. A deeper dive into specific course requirements demonstrates significant differences between the two programs. The existing program at UMGC requires a total of 33 program specific credits, and the proposed program at Morgan would require a total of 74 program uh, specific requirements. As part of uh, Morgan's School of Business and Management, which holds accreditation from the Association to Advance Collegiate, uh, Collegiate Schools of Business, the proposed Morgan program would require business courses in accounting, finance, and marketing that are not required in UMGC's existing program. The unique business courses uh, in Morgan's proposal total 42 credits. While students at UMGC may minor or double major in business, the traditional business courses are not an explicit requirement of the UMGC existing program. The proposed program from Morgan is a unique combination of cybersecurity courses and traditional business courses. Additionally, when reviewing a side-by-side -side comparison of the cybersecurity courses within each program, there is minimal overlap based on course descriptions. There are only five courses that have similar descriptions between the two programs, and you can find that information in Table 5. In addition, there are six unique cybersecurity programs in each program, and those differences are outlined on page, uh, pages 8 through 10. This comparison demonstrates that despite similarities in program descriptions and objectives, the two programs are fund fundamentally different in content. Secretary Fielder, I turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. 
the other part is that the, the third element is the institutions um, have different unique and distinct missions and each of the institution plays a different role within Maryland public higher higher edu sorry higher education UMGC is an open access for your institution with a mission to improve the lives of adult learners Morgan is designated as Maryland's preeminent public urban research university with a mission of instruction research and service by virtue of these missions the two institutions have differing admissions requirements and attract a different student population as Morgan notes while UMGC mission is focused on adult learners and working adults with a population where only 20 percent of the students are under 25 nearly 90 percent of Morgan's learners are between the ages of 18 to 25. More specifically, Morgan's program targets first-time college grower, goers and recent high school graduates. Additionally, there are uh, selective institutional admission requirements for Morgan and UMGC is a global open access institution. Therefore, UMGC's program will inherently attract a wider selection of students. In con conclusion, we do not dispute, dispute that these similarities between the two programs However, I believe that the differences in academic content and mission outweigh these similarities. Moreover, even if these programs were determined to be duplicative, in spite of these differences, any duplication is not unreasonable in this instance. With the market demand far outstripping the supply of graduates from Maryland cybersecurity programs, even with Every graduate staying in Maryland, the state's current cybersecurity offerings meet less than half of the current or projected demand. And I'm going to read a direct statement from page eight of UMGC Smittle. And it states the decision seems to reflect a regulatory posture that recognizes no single Maryland institution can single handedly meet such a large workforce demand. Therefore, MHEC's approval of Morgan's BS in CIM seems to take the stance that a multiplicity of complementary programs and offerings at Maryland post-secondary institutions in high demand technology fields helps keep Maryland's economy competitive. And with that, I would in, again encourage you to support my May 16th decision. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Secretary Fielder and Dr. Dow. Um, let me open it up. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Um, so um, I did have one question for Secretary Fielder about the, the the five schools in Maryland that are offering programs in this area. Yes. Uh, do you see major differences among those five programs in any way? Uh, what do you mean differences in terms of? The differences of when they started, but this is a listing of the same classification code for the same program. So just because it's a, a U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, yeah, that's good, Department right. of Education's uh, classification, the program should be very similar by that very design. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, Emily, you want to add anything to that to clarify for Commissioner Boyd? Yeah, so it, this is a little tricky for us um, because there is across the state and across the nation, there is a little bit of a compounding issue between traditional, just you're going to learn cybersecurity. You're, you're going to learn how to be a technician. You're going to learn how to code. You're going to learn about hacking. You're going to learn about cybersecurity stuff. The proposed program from Morgan and what UMGC offers is more a cybersecurity management program where there are elements of how do you manage cybersecurity systems and how do you do that work? The SIP code currently being used for both of these programs and what you find in the statement kind of they balance between those two um, approaches a traditional cybersecurity training versus training people to be both cybersecurity professionals and move into a more management-like position. 
Okay. So it's it, it's it's hard to answer your question because some of the programs on that those five programs, a couple of them are just traditional cybersecurity training. You're learning to be a professional in cybersecurity, whereas the the programs at hand right now are really about training individuals to manage cybersecurity entities. That helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, any other questions? All right, let me um, ask President Fowler uh, to begin his remarks and, um, and and afterwards, if there are questions that you know take us back to Secretary Field or Dr. Dow, we can certainly accommodate that. So President Fowler, uh, welcome, and I don't know how you know, um, if you will be having others join you on the presentation, but I'll let you introduce that. Well, and certainly, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for uh, giving us this opportunity to come before you with this. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to my Chief Academic Officer, Blakely Palmetto, whose uh, team will be uh, making the presentation here today. And I'll be sitting here for any questions that come to me as a result. So thank you. And I'll turn over to Blakely and Jennifer Frank, her Deputy Chief Academic Officer. Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Sauerkamp, Commissioners, Secretary Fielder, Assistant Secretary Dow, and our colleagues in attendance from MHEC and from Morgan State University. As my president said, my name is Blakely Pamietto, and I'm Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Chief Academic Officer at the University of Maryland Global Campus. I'm here today with my colleagues from UMGC, including Frank Principe, Senior Vice President for Government Affairs and Strategic Partnerships, Dr. Jennifer Frank, Deputy Chief Academic Officer, and Dr. Douglas Harrison, Vice President and Dean of UMGC's School of Cybersecurity and Information Technology. I want to thank the Commission for the opportunity to share why we believe the Secretary's decision regarding Morgan State University's proposal for a Bachelor of Science program in cybersecurity intelligence management should be overturned. UMGC has long been an innovator and leader in cybersecurity education. In 2010, we launched our Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity Management and Policy in recognition of the workforce need for non-technical cybersecurity professionals who are focused on the management, governance, and policy aspects of cybersecurity. The Cybersecurity Intelligence Management Program proposed by Morgan State and approved by the Secretary explicitly addresses this same dimension of the cybersecurity field and workforce constituting unreasonable duplication as defined in the Code of Maryland regulations. And the program is poised to do demonstrable harm to UMGC's unique program in this area. It is our position that the Secretary's approval of Morgan's Cybersecurity Intelligence Management Program is inconsistent with and contradicts other recent decisions made by the Secretary and that the approval of Morgan's Cybersecurity Intelligence Management Program represents inconsistent application of the governing regulations re relating to unreasonable duplication and demonstrable harm. UMGC respectfully requests that the Commission either reverse the Secretary's decision and disallow Morgan's Cybersecurity Intelligence Management Program to go forward, or alternatively, for the Commission to support a reconsideration of UMGC's 2021 proposal for a Bachelor of Science in Cloud Computing Systems, which was previously denied under the regulatory standards of unreasonable duplication and demonstrable harm. On September 4th, 2020, and updated on October 1st, 2020, Secretary Fielder issued formal guidance to the presidents of all higher education institutions operating in the state of Maryland outlining the criteria for an institution to justifiably object to a program proposal by another institution. This guidance, he wrote, will be used as the standard for which we will evaluate objections. Grounded in Maryland regulations, the secretary identified four criteria as constituting bases for objections. Within each criterion, he defined, defined the detailed data and information that must be provided to support the reasons for the objection. The third of these four criteria for objecting to a proposal is unreasonable program duplication, which would cause demonstrable harm to another institution. Under this criterion, 
the Secretary's guidance identifies seven evidentiary standards that detail the data and information an objecting institution must provide to substantiate the objection of unreasonable program duplication and demonstrable harm. UMGC formally objected to Morgan's proposal for a Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity Intelligence Management on the basis of unreasonable program duplication and demonstrable harm to our institution, and specifically to our unique program in cybersecurity management and policy. In our objection, we provided clear and extensive data responsive to each of the seven evidentiary standards to show that Morgan's proposed program indeed constitutes unreasonable program duplication, which would cause demonstrable harm to another institution, as defined by the regulations and the Secretary's guidance letter. The first standard for an objection on the basis of unreasonable program duplication and demonstrable harm is evidence that there is an existing program with similar curriculum and program objectives. UMGC's cybersecurity and management program has been in continuous operation from 2010 through today, with an unchanged focus on the non-technical management, governance, and policy aspects of cybersecurity. A comparison of our existing program to Morgan's proposed program reveals significant overlap in terms of delivery modalities, program descriptions, learning outcomes, curriculum, course content, and requirements. And while the secretary has cited the SIP codes for cybersecurity associated with these and other programs in the state, SIP codes are notoriously a bad descriptor for a rapidly changing field, and even the National Institute of Standards and Technology has acknowledged this. The second standard is evidence of current student enrollment in an existing program. UMGC enrolled approximately 3,000 students during the last academic year, and our program has capacity to accommodate significant growth. The third standard is evidence that the purpose or objective of the proposed program is duplicative of an existing program. Both UMGC's existing program and Morgan's proposed program focus exclusively on the non-technical administrative policy and management aspects of cybersecurity. A side-by-side -side review of the stated outcomes for each program clearly shows the significant overlap in program outcomes of Morgan's proposed program with those of UMGC's. The fourth standard is evidence and thorough analysis that an existing program has similar curriculum and course offerings. Morgan intends to offer its program both face-to-face -face on campus and online, duplicating both modalities through which UMGC offers our program. UMGC's program is offered fully online and in hybrid modality across the state. Moreover, a review of the available course descriptions for Morgan's program also demonstrates the overlap of content in Morgan's courses with the content in UMGC's courses. The fifth standard is evidence and analysis that existing programs currently meet market demand. UMGC's program can respond to market demand and projected growth in non-technical cybersecurity jobs. Estimates of job openings in Maryland in the cybersecurity management and policy domains track closely with the headcounts in UMGC's cybersecurity management and policy program. In addition, our program has additional enrollment capacity and is therefore well positioned for growth to handle the projected 44% increase in job demand for cybersecurity policy and management jobs in the next 10 years. The sixth standard is evidence that tuition costs, including fees, admission requirements, and graduation requirements of the proposed program is duplicative of an existing program. Both universities comply with the Code of Maryland regulation requirements for admission and graduation. Where UMGC is an open admission institution by mission and state mandate, Morgan does apply other criteria during the selection process, but the institutions have similar tuition rates. The seventh and final standard is evidence that the implementation of the proposed program would cause demonstrable harm to another institution. The secretary's guidance document specifically notes that demonstrable harm may include the transition of enrollment from one institution to another, such that enrollment in an existing program would decline in light of addition of a similar or duplicative program. 
Morgan's program duplicates both the modality and curriculum of UMGC's existing program. Our two institutions are in relatively close geographic proximity, and Morgan's campus is proximal to where 22% of UMGC's current cybersecurity management and policy students reside. Collectively, these factors represent a high risk of harm to undermine UMGC's existing program, including a loss of enrollment in the program. The Secretary's May 16th, 2022 letter approving Morgan's program over UMGC's objection cited three bases for that decision. He cited Morgan's inclusion of traditional business courses in addition to the primary cybersecurity requirements and constituted this and considered this constituting a unique differentiator to UMGC's program. The secretary cited that the two institutions have unique and distinct missions, and he cited the growing need for not only cybersecurity professionals, but also cybersecurity professionals with management and leadership skills and training. It is our position that this three-part rationale fails to apply the aforementioned evidentiary standards for harmful duplication as established in Comar and referenced in the October 2020 guidance. With regard to the first of the Secretary's points, similarity in curriculum, programmatic objectives, and purpose are cited as bases for unreasonable duplication in the Secretary's guidance. However, a count of the number of courses in different areas of study is not articulated as within the scope of that standard. The Secretary may believe that Morgan's inclusion of a slate of business course requirements in addition to their cybersecurity course requirements differentiates the programs, but in fact, UMGC's curriculum of cybersecurity management and policy courses are actually designed to teach the necessary business principles in the context of cybersecurity. Whereas Morgan requires business courses and cybersecurity courses, UMGC's curriculum comprises courses uniquely created for this program in which business and cybersecurity content, principles, and their interrelated dynamics are integrated and taught together throughout the curriculum. UMGC's curriculum deliberately uses a spiral approach to progressive skills development in which concepts are infused and reinforced in multiple courses at increasing depth or breadth. The absence of standalone business courses in UMGC's curriculum does not constitute a material difference in the two curriculums, but rather shows only a difference in program design, not substance, not outcomes, and not career objectives. To the Secretary's second point regarding institutional missions, the Secretary's own guidance does not indicate in any of the seven evidentiary standards that distinctions in institutional mission or type are factors sufficient to justify unreasonable duplication. Finally, to the Secretary's third point, there are no shortages of cybersecurity programs in the state. The labor projections cited by the Secretary do not distinguish between technical and non-technical positions in the cybersecurity field, but an employer who hires for cybersecurity positions will surely reinforce that technical and non-technical positions are very different roles and skill sets. Further, the labor projections cited by the Secretary do not distinguish among the qualifying credentials for these positions. The data provided does not address which of these jobs requires a bachelor's, master's, or other form of credential or professional experience, and it is an erroneous assumption that the qualifications for these jobs are unilaterally the same. UMGC's existing undergraduate program in cybersecurity management and policy is unique among the more than 50 cybersecurity related programs offered throughout the state and it has capacity to grow. Additionally, the national shift to a skills-based economy and declining undergraduate enrollments nationwide and in Maryland are other education and workforce trends not accounted for in the Secretary's rationale. These trends, considered alongside the lack of nuance in the workforce projections data, should be cause for great pause before concluding that another undergraduate degree is what the market needs. Finally, not only is UMGC's bachelor's level cybersecurity management and policy program unique and well-equipped to meet the projected increase in cybersecurity, management, policy, and related non-technical jobs over the next decade, through our master's degree in cybersecurity management and policy, 
we are also supporting the imperative for continuous upskilling to meet workforce demand for employees who already hold a bachelor's degree and who seek additional credentials for skills and career advancement. For all of these reasons, we believe that the Secretary's decision to approve Morgan's program fails to appropriately apply the evidentiary standards for unreasonable duplication and demonstrable harm. In the last 15 months, the Secretary has denied UMGC two program actions when another institution objected on the basis of unreasonable duplication and demonstrable harm. The most recent of these was the Secretary's denial of UMGC's proposal for a Bachelor of Science in Cloud Computing Systems. If the Commission were to review the documentation provided by the objecting institution and by UMGC in that case, along with the rationale for denying the proposal as articulated in the Secretary's decision letter in that case, you would find that all seven of the evidentiary standards I have reviewed today were expressly cited as the basis for denial. In contrast, in the case of Morgan's program proposal that we are discussing today, none of these evidentiary standards were applied in the Secretary's decision in spite of the data and information provided. As we have shown, his three-part rationale does not invoke any of the evidentiary standards outlined in his 2020 guidance letter and which was to serve as the standard for which MPEC will evaluate objections. As this commission knows, Maryland's system of higher education is critical to the state's socioeconomic strength and growth. The absence of consistent guidelines and consistent application of the regulatory and program approval standards hampers all institutions' abilities to maintain the alignment of their curriculum offerings to their institutional missions, to meet rapidly evolving workforce demands, both in Maryland and nationally, and to remain competitive in local and national markets all with the agility and alacrity that is necessary to keep pace in today's dynamic landscape of higher education and workforce needs. We believe we have shown that the Secretary's decision to approve Morgan's program is in direct conflict with the prior precedent he has established for applying the evidentiary criteria associated with unreasonable duplication and demonstrable harm. We also contend that conflicting signals from MHEC about the application of regulations, rules, and guidance for program approvals make it difficult for any Maryland post-secondary institution to bring forward new proposals. No institution enters into the program approval process without extensive research, deliberation, and preparation, as is reflected in the rigor and substance of the proposals MHEC receives. These are inefficient and ineffective efforts if institutions cannot rely on adherence to the guidance the Secretary has provided. Institutions lose time, resources, and the opportunity to keep pace with shifting and evolving market signals if the process is not clear and consistent. In conclusion, UMGC respectfully requests that the Commission support one of two resolution outcomes. First, UMGC asks the Commission to reverse the Secretary's approval of Morgan's Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity Intelligence Management based on his previous application of standards and guidance regarding unreasonable duplication and demonstrable harm. Alternatively, UMGC asks the Commission to endorse and support UMGC's 2021 Bachelor of Science in Cloud Computing Systems proposal. Should the Commission find this appropriate, it may also be only fair and reasonable to reconsider other decisions made regarding objections based on unreasonable duplication and demonstrable harm. New reviews by the Secretary to ensure regulatory consistency aligned with the approval of Morgan's Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity Intelligence Management would help provide clarity and confidence to the higher education community regarding the evaluation of objections as part of the academic program review and approval process. I thank the Commission for the time and the opportunity to present UMGC's appeal of the Secretary's decision to allow Morgan State University to proceed with a new program that unreasonably duplicates and stand, stands to cause demonstrable harm to one of UMGC's unique and differentiating programs. This concludes my prepared remarks. I'd like to request that the remainder of UMGC's time be reserved for the opportunity to make closing remarks. Thank you.
Commissioner Surkamp, I think you're on mute. Thank you, I thought I had taken that off, sorry. Um, Dr. Pomerietta, do I understand that we can, that you're comfortable if we take some questions now and then you might have some concluding remarks. Okay, so let me open it up for the commissioners to see if there are any questions. Madam Chair, this is Chuck McDaniels. I had a general question for UMGC. Um, we've heard from a number of sources that the marketplace demand for graduates in this area is increasing and should continue to increase over the next couple of years. Um, but if I'm interpreting some of the background information correctly, the number of degrees uh, awarded in this area by UMGC has actually been in decline since uh, 2017 through 2020. And I just wondered if the uh, university had any comments about um, whether that's accurate, there has been a decline and uh, how that relates to your ability to uh, address, you know, uh, an increasing demand if you're awarding less degrees uh, over the last recent years. Uh, this is Doug Harrison. Uh, thank you all again for having uh, us to the, the commission's time and for your attention to our uh, our information. So, uh, Commissioner McDaniel's, it's it's an excellent question, and uh, like a lot of these things, there's not a, a one simple answer. But I'll offer you a couple of different perspectives because what you're actually asking, I think, quite astutely, is how to understand the rapidly shifting ways that training skills development and higher education are having to change to respond to the, the differences that an economy totally driven these days by rapidly changing technologies have to adjust. So one way I'd say you think you could think about those declines uh, in, in, in degree production is related to the fact that cybersecurity jobs that focus on technology are just more profitable and there are more, there are more of them. And so you can often see people who might have started in a management and policy program thinking they don't have the chops or they're too intimidated by a technology, straight ahead technology degree. They get into it, they succeed, and they may go over there. Uh, so that's one potential dynamic. The other is that over the time period that you're looking at in that data, uh, you've seen a rapid shift in what uh, uh, CAO Pamietto talked about in terms of uh, an adoption, especially in the cyber world, to relying on skills mapping as opposed to just a pure traditional four-year degree or a master's degree. While those are going to continue to be uh, kind of the gold standard for certifying knowledge, the rapidly changing job market means that shorter bursts of learning align to smaller credentials. We offer certificates in cyber management policy, for instance. There's strong enrollment there. We also align our cyber management and policy curriculum and our other cyber curriculum to industry certifications in cyber. Industry certifications are the coin of the realm in terms of uh, uh, agreeing upon what are the skills that drive demand. And there's such demand in these jobs that a lot of people can get a, a three course certificate that say are the first three courses in the program uh, and, and get a job. And so that might cause them to step away from the program, but we are confident that they, we've aligned our curriculum in a way that stays current and relevant and will allow them to come back should they wish to pursue a fuller degree. Same thing with entry certifications. We prepare students to take those with all of our courses in cybersecurity technology and with several in cyber management and policy. So a student can successfully take the course, get the certification, they may be able to reach their career goal and step away. And that's recognizing the signals that the market are sending to us, that industry send to us about how we've got to be thinking differently uh, as, as we are at UMGC about disaggregating uh, big credentials into smaller chunks of certifiable learning that they can leverage in a rapidly changing market. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Coleman has a question. Uh, Commissioner Coleman, I think you might be muted. I'm sorry. My question is, if I just finished high school and applied to for a BS degree at your campus, would I be accepted at that time with no experience? Yes, absolutely. That's our mission. We're proud of that. Would I get any face-to-face -face instructions? That would depend on the modality that you elect to uh, take. So we offer our programs, as uh, the CAO talked about, both fully online asynchronously, 
uh, as well as in hybrid modality, which means that the students take some of their courses, some of their work online, and then they periodically meet face to face uh, with with faculty member. We've certainly known. Th Uh, Dr. Interaction. Dr. Harris, I think you're frozen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll let one of my colleagues take it. Does anybody want to pick up on that? May yeah, I, be you, back I can by now? hear you now. Yes. Okay. I apologize. Uh, my connections. I, I'm actually literally at an NSA sponsored conference for cybersecurity leaders, and uh, uh, but I, we ironically don't have great connection here. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, it, the face-to-face -face instruction that we see in hybrid we saw really work well to keep students attached even in our asynchronous classes and so we're seeing a lot more face-to-face -face interactions whether it's one-on-one -on -one, faculty member mentoring the student or meeting in small groups or meeting as a group of the whole uh, so uh, you would have a, a, several different options for how you might want to interact if, if you as a student wanted to interact face-to-face -face with a faculty member uh, thank you that commissioner boyd Yes, I have a question related to where we were just sort of focusing a moment ago, uh, having to do with the decline that um, Commissioner McDaniels mentioned. I wonder if you have any research, because it was said earlier that you offer this particular course 100% online. So I'm curious about your graduation rate since 2010. If I heard it correctly, 2010 is when you started in this area with this particular focus. What do your graduation rates look like over time? It's been roughly 10, 12 years. So who would like to answer that question? I will say that um, the numbers are in, the data is in the proposal. I will say that because of that poor connection, I've not been able to actually download the documents to look at them. And, and uh, I mean, I, I, I don't also have to just recite what's in the proposal, um, but they there there certainly was, if you think about a 10 year, well, 12 year now arc from our launch of our programs in 2010, uh, we saw a rapid uptick over the first five to seven years in all of our programs. Uh, we uh, are one of the only institutions in the U.S. that offers standalone degrees in now five different cyber-related domains. Many programs put them in uh, aspects of those five or six different things into one or two programs. So because we offered that, at the time, fairly unique uh, opportunity, we saw growth and graduation uh, go up in the first years of our program. Uh, a couple of things began to happen five to seven years and the launch because we were one one of the first universities in the country to invest so heavily in cyber education. Uh, we frankly had much more market share in those early years as other universities began to see the, the criticality and the ubiquity of uh, cybersecurity across the economy and industry. They started launching their programs too. And of course, you introduce more competition, you're going to see enrollments uh, and potentially uh, graduation rates decline if people start your program and migrate to something that they think is newer or more competitive. So. We know that that rapid increase in competition within higher education is one of the drivers for our enrollment and graduation trends. The question is really related to the form in which you offer your courses. And if you have 100% online course offerings, that's a huge contrast to what I think Morgan is talking about with the format that they use to offer their courses. So we're talking about differences yeah. here. And my question really had to do with what is the graduation rate given the approach that you have to the offering of this course and is that related to this decline in number of students in your program that we've seen over the last few years that is the question uh, so I, I apologize for not understanding the question the first time around i appreciate your clarification um, i think it's an interesting question i i don't think that the the literature and the research around the links between modality and graduation rates have uh, consistently identified any uh, statistically verified link between the mode you teach in and the graduation rate. And we certainly uh, offer our courses not just fully online, but we also offer them in this program and many others in the hybrid modality. Uh, and so that graduation rate that you're seeing reflects multiple kinds of modalities. There are even some of our overseas uh, instruction that's gonna be fully face-to-face -face at times. 
Uh, so the modality we don't think so much is account, is what we would get, account for it. I can't. I don't know enough information from what's public publicly available and wouldn't want to speak to our colleagues at, at Morgan about how they plan to deliver their online version of this program. There are different ways to, there are different modes of delivering online learning. You can have it fully asynchronous, that is, as we do because we're global and our students are all over the world, we don't require in most of our classes that students meet face-to-face -face in a classroom the way we normally do because they might be spread out all over, all over the world. It also allows our, our faculty member to work with them one-on-one -on -one more closely. Uh, but you can also deliver uh, uh, online instruction uh, where all of it is done face to face in the way that we're interacting right now. And that's a very different way. So just to say that we deliver online, it's important to make the distinction about how one delivers it online. We do it a couple of different ways, as I was saying. Yeah, so uh, what I was we would just say, asking, I'm sorry. I was just asking, do you have any research that supports how you deliver the courses, whether it's online, oh, yeah. whether it's hybrid, whether it's face to face? relative to your graduation rates we i don't we well, have I'll, not I'll, looked I'll at graduation like, uh, respond to that yeah no we we have not looked at graduation rates by modality because our students actually move between modalities based on their circumstances so we see most of our students take online courses and as the primary modality and then sample from the hybrid offerings more around what is convenient for them at that particular point in their uh, path of study. So they aren't two separate enrollment pathways for our learners. It's all really all uh, meshed into one and there's one graduation rate for the program as a whole. Okay, can we move on to one other thing now that you're speaking? You mentioned over and over again this demonstrable harm and you gave an example of that and that really was related to the question of who finishes, who graduates. Can you give me some more examples of what would be demonstrable harm from your point of view? For us, the most important one is certainly related to program enrollment. And the issue that we are trying to underscore today is the likelihood that we would see a loss of enrollment in this program. As Dean Harrison has already described, we know that we have seen some de decline in enrollment because of other competition in the market, not just from higher education institutions, but also because we are seeing a shift to other forms of credentialing for professionals in high demand areas. And so as we look to make sure that we are maintaining a vibrant and healthy program, if we add another point of competition into our geographic proximity in particular, because of our mixed modalities, we think that that is a critical focus for a likelihood of demonstrable harm. Okay, so this is one factor that you look at. So we're to understand your view of this demonstrable harm is in the area of enrollment. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other questions? All right. Um, so, Dr. Palmieri, how about if you take a minute or two to conclude? We're beyond the 20 minutes, but I said that I would allow more time for the questions. But if you would wrap things up, please. Absolutely. Thank you. I think what I would like to do is also close with a statement that we included in our uh, appeal letter to the secretary. Um, he read a quote, actually, that came from that letter. Uh, but this is the statement that preceded that and it reflects the decision he had made previously about UMGC's Bachelor of Science in Cloud Computing Systems. I'm quoting from our letter. In upholding the objection to UMGC's proposal for a Bachelor of Science in Cloud Computing Systems just a year ago, a proposal that documented a similarly large unmet and growing demand for cloud computing professionals in Maryland and across the United States, the secretary takes the position that the objecting institution, and I quote, has the potential to grow and meet the statewide demand, even though the institution's own estimates indicate that the program will produce at most 100 graduates in the fifth year of the program's existence. This decision takes the opposite position from what is articulated in the secretary's approval letter of Morgan Cybersecurity Intelligence Management Program over UMGC's objection. And this really does encapsulate the most important part of our posture on this, which is if the standards are the standards, we would like to see them applied equitably to all program considerations, irrespective of the sponsoring institution. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before um, I um, I'll hand things over to Dr. to President Wilson, I just want to make certain that the commissioners don't have any other questions at this point. And um, Chair Sir Camp, Jennifer speaking. Um, if the secretary has remaining time, if he wanted to offer anything in rebuttal. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Secretary Fielder. Now, in terms of a rebuttal, I think that each of these decision stands on their own. Um, a year ago decision and the changes in the economy are different. Um, when we when we take a look at the need for consistency, the previous decisions which were mentioned by Pamietto had to do with an HBI that had existing programs with UMGC objecting. And this is the reverse of that. But again, it is a mix of need for us to be aware and critical of supporting HPI. So that is part of the decisions that is part of influencing, you know, as we move forward. And that that would conclude my report. Thank you, Secretary Fielder. President Wilson, uh, you and your team have 10 minutes if you want to give a response. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, we will try to be very judicious with our time. I, I would just like to take uh, two or three minutes uh, and make a few general uh, remarks uh, and then turn it over to Dr. Sanjay Bapta, uh, who is our major professor uh, here at the university. We also have with us Dr. Hong Tao Yu, our provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. Um, to uh, uh, Madam Chair and members of the commission, uh, Secretary Fielder, uh, to President Fowler and our UMGC colleagues. Uh, we are here uh, because uh, we have proposed a program uh, that we think uh, is in alignment um, with the mission of Morgan uh, and is uh, taking us down a path uh, to strengthen existing relationships that we have garnered with uh, industry uh, as well as um, the support that we have received from the state of Maryland uh, four or five years ago. Uh, to build out a research center here called the CAP Center, uh, the uh, Cybersecurity and Assurance Policy Center. Um, and that center is uh, now uh, bringing in uh, several million dollars a year from NSF and other agencies, uh, in addition to the ongoing $2 million uh, state appropriation that we get. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, we at Morgan take program duplication quite, quite seriously. Uh, especially since uh, this is an area uh, that has been uh, one of the long-standing kind of bones of contention, if you will, uh, in Maryland higher education that has resulted in long-standing litigation, as I think Secretary Fielder was alluding to. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, our Board of Regents, um, in my 12 years as president here, uh, we have a policy uh, where uh, anytime we bring forward a program to our board, academic degree program to our board to be approved, uh, the Secretary of, of the Academic and Student Affairs Committee uh, is requiring that the university look across the higher ed system in Maryland to ensure that that program is non-duplicative. Otherwise, the board will not act on it. Uh, and so when you look at all of the degree programs that we have gotten approved in the last several years, they have followed that particular path. Uh, and uh, uh, faculty members, uh, deans are uh, really charged with looking across the landscape uh, to make sure we're not bringing forward a program that is clearly duplicative of uh, programs in other institutions. Um, I believe, uh, and Secretary Field, I may be incorrect here, but I believe that this could very well be the first time that um, that an institution is objecting to a program that Morgan has proposed in terms of a new academic degree program in my, in my tenure, I could be off a little bit. And that's because we do take care uh, in looking across the landscape because uh, we don't want to uh, do the kinds of things that we objected to for years uh, that were being done to duplicate programs at Morgan. Uh, and so, uh, that's where we are uh, in terms of the details of uh, our response to the University of Maryland Global Campus, uh, whom um, 
personally, I have the highest regard for in terms of its global mission. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, we agree with the decision made by Secretary Fielder in the May 16th letter. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Bapna. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. And Dr. Bapna, um, there's about five minutes remaining. Can I share my screen? I'm sorry. Can you share your screen? Um, uh, do I have the permission to share? Uh, I'm not, but yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Dr. Dalsing, yes. <laughs> yes, there's a button at the bottom. It has a little square with an X or with an arrow pointing up. Correct. And uh, let me share the entire uh, screen to see if that works. Uh, Dr. Bapton, yeah. nothing has shared yet. I would say yeah. go ahead and start with your presentation. And sure. Then... So uh, uh, let me to briefly talk about uh, the differences in academic programs, specifically with respect to the substance. Uh, and uh, this deals with the credits in the business uh, school that all students are required to take uh, as part of this major. I'll go over a few of this requisite knowledge that every single student in the BS in Cybersecurity Intelligence Management program has to uh, be conversant with. Uh, so th the core courses that every student needs to take to form the foundational knowledge for cybersecurity, intelligence management. All students need to take accounting one, accounting two, which lays the foundation for auditing principles, very critical for cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, all the courses I'll be talking about, they are not required for uh, UNGC's program. And both those programs deal with managing cybersecurity. So, our program requires the foundational knowledge in accounting one, two, critical for auditing. Our students need to take a course in finance. How is that relevant? Uh, ransomware as an example. Uh, state agencies and other companies face this ransomware, but our students are equipped with that knowledge to uh, examine ransomware as an example to make cybersecurity investment decisions. Uh, supply chain management is a required course for our students. Uh, what does it do? Uh, get to the students a conceptual knowledge on the risks of supply chain. Another very important aspect in cybersecurity uh, management. Then there are three courses on the management aspect, leadership aspect. Those three courses are organizational behavior, business communication, uh, business leadership. Our students. Uh, from this program have to have that knowledge in order to uh, be uh, uh, get a BS in cybersecurity intelligence management. Uh, there are two courses on the policy aspects uh, that further give students the background on this uh, policy aspects of legal and ethical environment of business is one. The second is business and society, ethics and sustainability. Uh, so for all this list that uh, I'm referring to, UMGC's program does not require students to have this foundational knowledge. Uh, we have a course in, in business statistics. Uh, our program is also geared towards intelligence aspects. Uh, our program has required courses on data analytics. Uh, there's a course on scripting. So that's business statistics course of, uh, becomes a foundational knowledge for that intelligence gathering aspect of a program missing from UMGC's uh, program. International business, another course that's required. Uh, and that's to uh, critically uh, examine uh, the international environment for cybersecurity. Uh, multinational companies may be based out of the country. Uh, they need to know that uh, knowledge about international uh, business. 
we have a required course on management information systems. Uh, it covers the systems aspects of technology, as well as people and processes, all geared towards uh, management leadership aspects. Uh, we have a course on business policy, uh, which lays the foundation for uh, uh, understanding the business from a business strategic perspective. Uh, so all these credits uh, that our program has uh, gives the knowledge to the students to make them uh, cybersecurity uh, professional uh, from a management and a leadership aspect. Uh, when it comes to the major, uh, we have uh, uh, in our proposal courses on the intelligence management, uh, which uh, uh, data analytics is one of those courses. Uh, then we've got courses on ethical hacking, uh, threat mitigation and incident response, intelligence, uh, uh, cyber forensics. Uh, all of this makes uh, our program a non duplicator uh, uh, based on uh, UMGC's uh, program. So, yes, we are tackling the management aspect, but uh, giving that very strong foundational knowledge. Uh, the courses are also different uh, for both our programs. Uh, Dr. Bapna, um, thank you for those remarks. Um, Provost, you, um, yes, if in a minute or two, you can um, wrap things up and then I will see if the commissioners have some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, uh, everyone here on the panel. Uh, I just want to uh, answer the question from UMGC about this cloud computing, I felt there's a complete two different cases. Uh, this is cybersecurity is a very proven area for many years, uh, many several different degree programs in the state. Cloud computing, when we proposed, there were only three in the country, and there was none in Maryland. So we were the first program in Maryland. We were probably the three in the country at that point. That's why to duplicate that, uh, immediately in a state institution is a, a is a different scenario. I felt. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Commissioner Howe. You have a question. Yes, I do, and I hope I'm not muted. <laughs> um, my question is this: If someone enrolls at Morgan State University to get this uh, bachelor of science degree, how much longer does it take a student to acquire that BS? degree in comparison with what would be required to require courses to be taken at UMGC because you said all these extra courses that they have to take which involves uh, time and money the curriculum is 120 credit hours for both the programs so it's the same amount of time for UMGC's program uh, Roughly uh, around 46 credits are interdisciplinary students can take those 46 credits from any uh, any course across the campus, whereas uh, we expect students to take the business courses. So that's the major difference. Dr. Dar All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just to provide clarification, regardless of the program, all bachelor's degrees require 120 credits. So what we're talking about are program-specific required credits for these two programs. At the end of the day, it, each student seeking a bachelor's degree still has to earn 120 credits to uh, fulfill the requirements statewide. Um, from the commissioners, are there any other questions? Okay, and uh, Jennifer, I'm going to consult with you for a moment. I think um, uh, given the time allocations, we've given everybody what they're supposed to have, but I don't want to cut anybody short. No, I think everyone's had their, um, taken their full time or, okay. or uh, in the case of the secretary, not, not used the full time, but the other two the proposing and objecting institution have both used their full time. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. So th thank you all um, for your presentations and for helping us understand 
um, the issues more clearly. I uh, now need to move to close the meeting to consult with council to obtain legal advice regarding the review of Morgan State University's BS in cybersecurity intelligence management pursuant to section 3-305B7 of the general provisions article. Um, so I have um, put that out there as a motion. If I could have a commissioner second that, please. Could one of the commissioners second that? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Commissioner Howe. Um, and uh, from the commissioners, all in favor of moving into closed session at this point, please signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay, this uh, part of the meeting is closed. Uh, I would ask the commissioners to sign out and come back in on a different meeting link. Uh, again, thank you all very much. And everybody, I can make sure all the commissioners have the link. I sent it uh, earlier today. So just mm -hmm. email me thank if you know what happened. Thank okay, you. thank you.